So welcome everybody. I am Ren Rennick. I'm the CEO at the Pituitary Foundation. For those of you who aren't familiar with the Pituitary Foundation, we provide some support for the about 70,000 plus people in the UK affected by disorders of the pituitary gland, as well as their families, friends and support network. We've got a dedicated nurse helpline, online and print resources, communities that meet up and we work with leading medical experts to improve patient care. If you're not familiar with us, please do visit our website at pituitary.org.uk. But this event is part of our Pituitary Awareness Month 2022 Living Well programme and I'm really delighted to be joined by Professor Stephanie Baldeberg. Stephanie wears many, many hats, but she's talking to us today as the chair of the clinical committee for the Society for Endocrinology. If you don't know, the Society for Endocrinology is the UK's home of endocrinology, bringing together a global network of scientists, clinicians and nurses to share ideas and advance the discipline within endocrinology. So amongst this, Stephanie also works as a consultant physician in diabetes and endocrinology at the University College London Hospital, where she's head of department. And she has a special interest in pituitary disease and is brilliantly a trustee for us here at the foundation, as well as being vice chair of our medical committee. So thank you, Stephanie, for joining us today. Before we get going, the session today is looking at the future of endocrinology fairly wide as a brief, but to give a little bit of context before we dive into it. During the pandemic, the Society for Endocrinology's Clinical Committee realised that the unprecedented changes that the pandemic was bringing about created an opportunity to reconsider how endocrine services are delivered going forward. And a working group of passionate consultants who somehow found time shared ideas to create a vision which is at once practical in the short term and sustainable in the long term. And we're going to be looking at that today. But Stephanie, before we begin, could you tell us a little bit about your work and how you have kind of formed this amazing career? Lovely. Thank you very much, Ren. So thank you to you and the foundation for having me. It's a, it's a great pleasure to spend the next hour or so together. So thank you as part of this Pituitary Awareness Month. We've had many of those in different topics. So this is a slightly different different one this year. So thank you very much. And hello to everyone who will listen to this. So there we are, ready to start. Yeah. Brilliant. So you very kindly already introduced me. So you said everything which is on the slide. So I'm wearing many hats. And I think that's the beauty of a career in medicine, actually, that you can do lots of different things beyond the just doctoring. So uh, I'm an endocrinologist at University College London Hospitals. I have an academic uh, career at the University U UCL. I'm chair of the medical committee of the Society for Endocrinology for the last four years. I've been a trustee for the Pituitary Foundation, and I don't know how long for. I've, I've tried to look this up, and I think it must be something like 15 years or longer, but I'm not sure. And I'm vice chair of the foundation's uh, medical committee. So how did I get here, really? That's the question. Uh, I'm recording this from North London, uh, working from home today. Uh, I grew up in a place in, in near, near Berlin, really, in uh, between Berlin and Potsdam in Germany. And I then uh, did my medical training in Berlin. So I was a medical student in Berlin at the Humboldt University and graduated here. And then I came away with a degree and uh, two children, actually, young family, two children. So I cramped a lot into my student years. Uh, I then uh, really followed my husband, who's a scientist, to London. Uh, so so we, we, we went with, with a baby and a three-year-old came to London, uh, where he started working. And I enrolled uh, in further medical training, did special training in diabetes and endocrinology, and did a, a further academic degree, did an MD in diabetes at UCL. And then uh, in 2004, after all this, I was appointed a consultant endocrinologist at University College London Hospital. This was then a different hospital. A year later, this new uh, all singing, all dancing hospital was opened uh, on, the, on the Houston Road. And this is where, where I'm working. Uh, you will say there are seven days in a week what I'm doing 
with the rest. So I love baking. I have young grandchildren, so I'm spending a lot of time building dens in the woods. I do some Pilates and play tennis, and I generally like music, nature, socializing. So everything really like everybody else. Lots of things to relax as well. So what do I do clinically? Uh, I, I, my most of my work is in outpatient, so it's very patient-centered, diagnosing, treating, talking to referrers, and talking to colleagues, team meetings, ward consults. I do a fair bit of education, so teaching students, trainees, nurses, other teams, lecturing uh, national and internationally, uh, looking after our trainees, so to training the next generation of consultants. Uh, I'm examining at university, tutoring medical students, assessing registrars, and so on and so forth. I enjoy the research a lot, so I do quite a lot of patient outcome studies, so looking at what happens in pituitary disease. Uh, we, we did uh, work with during COVID, especially looking at how patients did with COVID and pituitary disease. I'm very interested in patient-reported outcome measures, so patient satisfaction, quality of life beyond the biochemical measurements. And now uh, very, very trendy is uh, artificial intelligence in pituitary disease. I do quite a lot of management, looking after my team, doing business cases, developing the service, a lot of troubleshooting, as you can imagine. Uh, and I do some outside the hospital work. So I'm working for the college, I'm working for the site of endocrinology, and I'm a trustee for the Pituitary Foundation. And then there's a few things I don't enjoy, complaints uh, which need to be answered, a lot of staffing gaps you will know from the news, very slow IT in the NHS, a lot of bureaucracy and forms across all demands, and we are still catching up with uh, COVID in, in quite underfunded health service. So this is about me. So let's come to the Society for Endocrinology. Uh, as Ren said, uh, it is the, is the home of endocrinology in the UK. Uh, so most people who are endocrinologists would join the Society for Endocrinology as their professional society uh, and as a great community, community to share ideas and advance uh, the endocrinology. We are looking both in the society at clinical and scientific education and research really for the public benefit. We are looking at recruitment, so attracting high quality scientists, doctors, nurses into endocrinology and supporting their development. We are doing quite a lot of public engagement work. And in fact, I'm on the public engagement committee as well. We are trying to give endocrinology a voice and raise its profile. And we are uh, looking at collaborating with the global endocrine community. I think the title of today's discussion is Defining the Future of Endocrinology. And this started Easter, the Easter when the, the first wave of COVID happened. So this will have been 2020, where we did a lot of firefighting and helped people across the UK and endocrinologists to decide what was important and what could wait and how to keep everybody safe. Uh, so we did a lot of work on that. And I think that we then thought this will eventually end this COVID uh, business. And is there anything we perhaps can usefully take out of this? So is there any, is this, will this allow us to, to learn and to, uh, to, 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 to apply this for after? So, so, so we, we, we spent quite a lot of time thinking about how to do this. And we wanted to be very open, very transparent, very inclusive. So we thought a lot about stakeholders. And we set up a group uh, to seize, as I say, here's new opportunities, to seize new opportunities to ensure world-class equitable care for patients with endocrine disorders by harnessing research, education, and new ways of working. Uh, and so we set up this group. For, we, we put a call out for members to join uh, across tertiary hospitals, DGA, so district general hospitals. We had uh, GP partners, patient partners, uh, by biochemists and so on for so specialist nurses. And we set up a working group in July of 2020. So this is the, the summer of the first year of the pandemic. And uh, we decided the remit should be very wide ranging. We should be very inclusive in our partners. We should look at innovative models of models of care, remote working, teaching training, patient passwords, pathways, and sharing best practice. 
And a lot of that, I think we had talked about before the pandemic, but somehow the pandemic brought this all much more into sharp focus. And we had three major work streams, uh, COVID, uh, the second wave. So what should we do beyond the firefighting? Is there something more structured we could do to put into place to keep people safe and manage their care well? We looked at resources and tools available. Uh, so this is, for example, I've been an endocrinologist for a long time. I have a lot of information leaflets, a lot of protocols. And my friends sort of have access to it. So people will email me and say, have you got something about this? And I will say, yeah, here it is. And we were thinking, how can we make this accessible to everyone, really? So, uh, so, so shared knowledge across the UK from senior people uh, and established units to make this accessible for every patient and every cl clinician. We then, uh, and, and the third point, the third stream was pathways and networks. We very early on decided that patient support groups were at the heart of these conversations and that we must have a patient voice very loudly around the table. Uh, and we did, uh, so we involved the patients, not just the Beauty Foundation, but all the patient support groups throughout our work. And actually that was a very, very good collaboration in, in the pandemic. Uh, very helpful in both directions. And we are, we were asking how could the healthcare change for the better of the patients? Uh, yes, and as I said, the patients were and are centric to this piece of work. So how did patient support groups help? We, we looked at who we had relations with, uh, which patient support groups, and interesting enough, many patient support groups didn't talk to each other. So we we put a system into place where they could where, where patient support groups could work together, uh, and that was very welcomed. Uh, so they could learn from each other, and we could learn from them, and support them. We had a survey to give valuable insight into models of care, uh, and ask the question: What would a good service look like? And then patient, these patient support groups talked with their patient representatives and shared the experience. Uh, both during and after the pandemic. And from the patient support group's feedback, there were four main, main themes identified. Access and communication, and that was very obvious in the pandemic that different, different ease of access was there for different patients. So it depended which units you were in, whether you could reach your endocrinologist or your endocrine nurse or not. Then there was education and training, safety and research. And again, we continued to receive support and advice from the patient support groups and also uh, offer support and advice and offer the networking, so a platform for the patient support groups to work with each other. So what did we come up with? We had a few recommend, we had quite a few recommendations, but we came up with a report uh, saying that endocrine services must be transformed to be more patient-centered and safe whilst delivering highest quality in clinical care and training. We were very clear that patient safety in key areas should be reviewed and enhanced, that patients should receive detailed, inf detailed information on their condition, and that the treatment options available, and that they have reassurance of abscess of significant pathology where appropriate. We also uh, really, I think, are very clear that endocrine helpline access for patients to specialist nurses should be available for all patients. These are provided by many patient support groups, but they need to enhancement uh, at provider levels so in the hospitals. And nurse and administration time needs to be costed into, uh, in when services are planned. Uh, and there's a link on this slide is where you can read more about the future of endocrinology uh, work, working group. So what should happen next? Uh, we are working with the clinic committee, so I'm, at the moment I'm the chair of the clinic committee. Uh, we are working with the clinic committee to implement some of the recommendations. We are using working methods of the pandemic, so virtual meetings, virtual appointments for patients to help develop new, new ways of working. We are working with patient support groups such as the Petuity Foundation to promote this work and uh, enable better patient care. And I think the thing which we had talked about a lot even before the pandemic was creating a portal of resources for healthcare professionals to access, to enable and support care of patients. So to share protocol, to share information uh, and to make access equitable across the, the country. And I think this is the, uh, the end of my talk.
So this is resources through the, uh, both for the uh, Society for Endocrinology. There's You and Your Hormones is a very interesting website, which articles on many hormonal questions. There's the Society for Endocrinology at the bottom. And then a lot uh, about, as Ren already pointed out, the Beauty Foundation, the Endocrine Help Nurse, and the Patient Support Helpline. So thank you very much for your attention. And I think I'm going to take questions from Ren, if there are any. Yes, thank you so much. Um, I feel like I'm a bit, if you stop sharing the screen, then it might, there we go, now we're back together. Um, thank you, that was absolutely fascinating and a really generous kind of overview of all the work that's been going on amongst everything else. And there were a couple of areas that I just wanted to ask you a little bit more about. So the four themes that came out, you talked about that being access and communication, education and training, safety and research. On the education and training, can you is that can you talk me through that a little bit more? What what you mean by that? Who are you educating and training? Is it the next foreign endocrinologists? Is it patients? I think it's every everyone. Uh, so so we are we are definitely and I mean the Petute Foundation has been like on at the forefront, for example, in Petute disease. But there's thyroid, uh, same for thyroid for Addison's disease for PCOS and so on. So patient information leaflets, so to get reputable sort of fair information for patients, because when you start Googling, it is not always uh, very well, very well yeah. screened. And it's not always safe, really. What the information is can be very scary, can be blatant misinformation. Uh, and so so it's, 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 I think, so educating patients is providing information for patients. And I think that will allow uh, better care because patients then can ask for they 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 they're more more as they are more educated they're more articulate they can ask what what they would like to know uh, they yes. can have a more meaning, meaningful discussion they can understand what what they can expect what should be expected so I think patient education is really very important and I think it's more and more important as as there are fewer resources in the healthcare so patient-centered uh, care. And we know that patients who are educated about their condition fare, fare better, they feel better and they fare better. Yes. So, uh, so, so that's one group. Then we, we, I think education of healthcare professionals who are not endocrinologists. So primary care, we work in many of the committees I mentioned, we are working very closely with uh, primary care. So, so as a GP, you have to know about asthma, about mental health, about fertility, about endocrinology. And it's, I think it's a big ask to assume GPs to be experts in everything. So again, yes. uh, it's, 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 it's partially educating, but it's also signposting for them. Where can they go if they have a question? What should they think of? And pituitary disease is rare, for example. So how can they, uh, yeah, how can they just think about it in the back of their head, head and then come to us if yes. they have questions yeah so to remember to ask the questions isn't it yes and, yes and, exactly and and, and the way that low, by that once they know us have, have a lower barrier of coming to us as well and asking a question yes so not, not feeling silly or because i think it's i think we appreciate people can't know everything uh, and then it's educating people in a hospital so for example what's a good example so acromegaly people have carpal tunnel syndrome for example not everybody but many people have a sort of thickening of the of the of the, of the tissues so they have nerve disturbances in the hands so you want to go, reach those people who treat to treat carpal tunnel syndrome to remind them that it could be part of acromegaly so we are so we are, and we are, so we are teaching rheumatologists uh, ophthalmologists obstetrician everyone cardiologists to think of the pituitary and how to safely treat pituitary patients. So those is, and then, and then of course it's junior doctors who haven't really chosen their specialty. And then it's other endocrinologists, of course. So it's, so it's, it's a wide, wide range of, of people we are yeah. hoping to educate. Which is a massive undertaking and it's no easy task when everyone's got their own agendas and are, are, are you know, busy with their own area as, as well. Isn't yes. it? But yeah. Always possible with a bit of tenacity. Um, the one of the areas that you, you also brought up was around helplines and the importance of patients being able to have access to that helpline. And obviously, it's something we feel really passionately about. And our helpline is really the engine of our work and is hugely valued um, and is life saving, I think, in many instances. Can you talk a little bit more about your views on helplines and that, that kind of one to one instant access support for patients? So, so I, I think ideally 
every patient would have a helpline at least in day hours to their endocrine team. But of course, if you had a nurse on that helpline, that nurse couldn't do other work. So it couldn't, she couldn't, she or he couldn't be in clinic talking to patients or doing a dynamic test or doing a ward round or prescribing or whatever else or do hydrocortin education. So it's it's a balance because I think if you have if you have somebody there instant, they are not doing something, they can't do something else. So they miss some. So 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 if money was no if there was money uh boundless i would say every unit should have an endocrine nurse uh yes. to be called i think uh but i'm not sure that's realistic and i think i'm again i'm i'm very wary i'm talking from a tertiary tertiary care point of view so we have several nurses uh, many big units in the uk have several endocrine nurses but not every hospital will be able to to have that because the hospital chooses different priorities so, so you could I, you could envisage I mean either using like Spituity Foundation, which is brilliant, or perhaps having a a hub, so having one endocrine nurse who might service several hospitals. I yeah? see. So could, yes, so that's so interesting. So that that might so you may need to be more more I don't know more creative I suppose. Yeah. Yes. But I I mean I I think I mean I've 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 had many patients who have spoken to the Pituity Foundation helpline, and as you say, found this life saving really very educational very helpful and it has helped helped actually with, with our work with them a lot as well because they they come in with a different understanding or uh yeah yes. so, so i i can only say positive things about it really oh excellent thank you very much um the and this this kind of whole area around education training helpline being able to ask this question feeds into safety and of course that is you know the one alert that goes off in your head as you're talking about safety and how how you can review it and enhance it and that surely is job number one and it's interesting to hear more about that for you so i think for example in the pandemic that was our main thing how to provide so how to keep everyone safe so if you were on this treatment or that treatment and or we had this schedule of blood tests, but we knew this couldn't happen. There was no access to these things because outpatients closed in many cases. That these were our main questions of who 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 is most vulnerable and who needs to be looked at supported most in a way. So so I think that's absolutely in those extreme times. But in in whatever you want to call normal times, there is I think safety has been more and more brought into the center of healthcare, which is good. We are, and that I think is most in most hospitals now, there's safety alerts about steroids, about desmopressin, and about insulin. So these are yeah. called life sustaining drugs. And if, they sto if they're stopped, uh, patients can be in, in great danger. So, so there's now many, many places have electronic health uh, notes, electronic notes. So, so that sort of pops up. So you put your, when your name comes up, it says this patient is on hydrocortisone, this patient is on this. And it, it links you to to a to an alert and says, "Do not stop this drug. Do talk to the endocrinologist." And, and is I, that something that patients can request, or is that something that's done on a trust by trust um, kind of system? So it's done. It's done on a trust by trust system. But I mean, a patient could ask, could say to the endocrinologist, "Is this something which happens in your trust?" Yeah. And if it isn't, they could say, "Why not?" And uh, they could even say, "The Pituitary Foundation is very." supportive of this and society for endocrinology and they probably can put you in touch with somebody who can help you yeah it's not easy again it's a lot of i think on one of my slides i had bureaucracy it's yes. it's very difficult to change system but it's it's, it's got to be done so, so so that's a good safety and there's um, a lot of work so the steroid card there's a lot of work done trust wide and also department of health wise on on keeping making things safer yeah. Yes, and the the safety alert um, is linked to the emergency card, isn't it? So yes, that's important for patients to have, but also reference the fact that there is a patient safety um, alert linked yeah. to it. Yeah, yeah. But exactly, so it's it's about safety safety cards, safety training. So patients, and uh, I mean, one of the things I think we always, and so in a pandemic, for example, I think we had about almost a thousand patients who were on steroids in our trial in our unit. We identified them and we approached them. So we wrote to them and said, if you are happy and you know what you're doing, that's fine. But if not, let us know and we will give you education. And our nurses called all these patients and 
uh, spoke with them because so we perceived them to be one of the most vulnerable groups. So I think, for example, if you had steroid training, but it's a while ago, or if you had it and you can't remember, again, go back to your team and say, I, I know you've done this, but I can't remember. Please, could you go through it with me again? Can I bring a relative, a friend? Uh, yes. Because it's quite hard after one session to to remember, even if you have everything written down. Uh, and that so, would be true. Obviously, you're speaking from an incredibly, incredibly well resourced, reasonably, obviously, with all the problems that come with it. But this would be true across the whole country, yes. even if you're just going to a smaller centre. Yes. There is appetite for you to be able to say, please, can you just give me a recap on this? Yes, um, 100%. And I think if, if they found, so if a smaller center found, say, I haven't got the resources, that would allow them to ask for the resources. So in yes. a way, unless you unless you ask for better, nothing will change. Yeah. You, it's, it's, it's tempting It's tempting to say, let's live in, in our means and do what we can do. But in, a, in almost in a way for our endocrine patients and for our pituitary patients, we've got to be selfish and say no no this isn't good enough and it's got to be as safe as possible uh everywhere yeah. yes and it is thinking when i'm mobilizing an army of pituitary patients across yes. the country but really it is for the pituitary patients who are coming as well isn't it it's asking the questions and changing changing how things are to make it better yes. going forward um, and it is it can be really simple just about communication and doing a really simple yes training session which is yeah. reasonably easy to do you talked at the beginning about the bits that you didn't enjoy I am most keen to be talking about the baking bits but focusing on the bits you don't enjoy and the the fact that you're still affected by COVID and and kind of working through the impact of that how long do you think that will last how how long will it go on for I think the health service was very underfunded before COVID yes and COVID was the uh, straw that broke the comet back really yeah. So yes. I think we were just coping and now we are not. So we have long, long waiting lists, uh, many gaps. So, 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 so I, I think as today I read, I can't remember 130,000 vacancies in the NHS. I read in one of the papers. So, so there's, so, so, so there's staffing gaps. Uh, there's not a lot of money to say, oh, we can just, there's no, neither the people there to employ nor the money to pay them. Uh, and so it's 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 so I suppose it's COVID on a background of an underfunded health service, uh, and it just it, it just gets gets worse and worse. So I think it's 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 a real worry. So so we have uh, because what we what we would like is to be really nimble. So if somebody calls and says I don't feel well, I would like to say come and see me tomorrow. But I yes. have no, but nobody has any any slots to see somebody. So to see somebody like that, I would have to ask somebody else not to come. Yes. So it's so so the it's work, a... the reality of this really amazing work around, you know, the future of endocrinology is against a really challenging backdrop. Is it realistic? Is it is it achievable? Are the, are the kind of interventions practical? So, so we talked about this a lot, and we talked about uh, what, why are we actually doing this, and how will we. Will it make a difference? So are we just writing a document and then nothing will change? But yeah. I think, again, I think you have to be ambitious and you have to believe you, it is achievable for the patients, for your service, in order to change something. And I think ju just even by asking people what's happening in their hospital and by saying this is what we think should happen, this is what's important to patients. So we, I think there was a very good, quite sobering survey by the Petrucci Foundation, which I think Pat McBride sent around Yes. patient feedback and that was very very yeah, sobering but also very interesting to read and what's important to patients and so I think just by even talking about it I'm sure things will improve because it, it just sharpens your eye and you think that's what my patients deserve so so is it at all achievable probably not sure but I think it just we've just got to keep going yeah try to make yeah. it better I think the the survey was really helpful um in many ways, because it, it, it talked about um, about a thousand people's experience of pituitary care over the last three years. So it went before the pandemic and through the pandemic um, and was the largest survey of its kind that had been done, kind of drawing a line in the sand and saying, this is where we are now. And there's really excellent areas and look at how they can be um, addressed and overcome. And lots of it is about communication. Um, which I would keep on arguing is really cheap. It's just mm -hmm. cheap, cheap to talk. It's okay. 
um, we just need to kind of think about how we can do it and be creative in, in creating the mechanisms and the coordination. Um, another area that you spoke about is AI and the role of AI, which you, you know, trendy as it is, is that a solution? Can that help us? Uh, yes, I yes, I think it can actually. I, I think it I think it will, it can. Uh, for example, so we are involved in all sorts of projects, but we are looking at pr a project to look at uh, MRI scans and can you predict? So people have an MRI scan for any reason. It will obviously be reviewed by a by, by a radiologist, and they would say, Oh, there's also a pituitary problem. But we, we have patients where we who we see when we look back at the scans with the benefit of hindsight, we say, oh, this was visible five years ago, only just, but it was visible. Uh, and whether it makes difference, nobody knows, but it would have been nice to know it then. So for example, AI could, could go through all these scans, through thousands of scans in the whole country. I don't know how many MRIs of the head are done and say, does the pituitary look normal? which you could never do with, an, with a radiologist who will do their best at the time, but, but you can't, but also will be asked a very specific question about the scan and may not be the pituitary, may not be the most important bit. So there's lots of things I think where AI can just help us to, 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 to do stuff which very time consuming and probably AI might do it better than, than we would if we, ask, if we use it correctly, if we ask the right question. So I'm not assuming AI will do, there will be a robot in my clinic, talk to my patients. Yeah, but it may be that there will be a robot who will, somebody will very well summarize and say, give me a little red alert and say, oh, actually, do you realize this patient's, I don't know, TSH is doing this or that? And that may be less important if you're very experienced, but maybe it's more important when you're not. But also if you have a large volume of patients, it might be helpful. So if there was a system where, where like a bit like safety alerts, which is, you could argue, is a form of AI or it's, it's saying, this patient has it. So I, I think it will be helpful. Yeah. And is it realistic in the short term or is this kind of like a 20 year vision or is it is it something that's a bit closer than that? I think a bit closer. So I would probably I would hope still in my professional life. So I want to say in about I would think in about some bits, maybe earlier even and probably in the next five to 10 years. Yeah. Yeah, because that it, it, that's um, really heartening, I think, because the diagnosis is one of the most challenging areas isn't it and it's how we can reduce that time to diagnosis which I appreciate you're not really but that awareness with GPs yeah. and across primary care is and picking up kind of incidental yeah. discoveries is what's really important and if you thought say acromegaly again if you had if you didn't need to rely on the knowledge of the individual GP but you could have a system which scrolls through all the notes in a practice or in an area yeah. And says, if you have seven of these, there's a chance you have acromegaly. So I don't know if you have back pain and heart disease and diabetes and something else, something else. Uh, and so these patients would be flagged for somebody to say, could you just think about acromegaly? And I'm sure in any specialties and gastroenterology and rheumatology, there will be similar conditions where people think there's a too long a time between diagnosis and between the yeah. onset of disease and diagnosis. So there again, AI, I think, will make a huge difference. Yes, it will bring more people to you, of course, which yes. will increase your waiting list. But we'll deal with that bit later. Exactly. Yeah, but you could argue they come to us then less affected, so they may need less less care, less time, less treatment. Yes, yes. may yes. actually yes. may actually be really worthwhile. positive. Yeah. Um, we've spoken a little bit about how patients can can ask for you know more training and more support and, and information and education. Is there anything else that you know we can we can talk to our pituitary community to do to support your work and support the future of endocrinology for the next generation as well? That's very interesting. Yeah, I, I mean this is a very small thing, and you may laugh now, but I'm going to say it. I think as much as we are supporting patients, we find uh, we, we 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 get we get strength out of patient support. So I think we like to hear when things don't go well, obviously, so we can make them better. But we also like to hear when things go well. So if someone says to my, for example, to my registrar, this was a very clear communication. Thank you for this. Or this was, that is really makes a big difference. And I don't think people appreciate how much, because there's a lot of 
everywhere, a lot of negativity, a lot of stress, a mm-hmm. lot of pressures. People had a very difficult time, everyone, patients and healthcare professionals in COVID. So I think just kindness uh, in both directions will go a long way. So I know that's not something you need to teach your patients, but your members, but still, I think uh, the small kindnesses in, in across the community will help a lot. That's excellent. And also doesn't need a budget attached to it, which is also very helpful. (laughs) It's all very (laughs) possible. Um, That's really helpful. And it's kind of brought the session to the end. And it's a really lovely way to end on it, to to ask for what you need as a pituitary patient, but also to recognise when your has been excellent. Um, Just as we're finishing up, we've got your excellence kind of summary of the importance of patients feeding back when care has been excellent um, or really positive for them as well as when it's been less than they would like Um, and that is something that I hope we can all do. Is there anything that you'd like to summarise or or say before we go in terms of the future for endocrinology? I mean I think the only thing to say is that I have been as I say I've been a trustee at the Petute Foundation for a very very long time Uh, and I yeah, I cannot I cannot stress much how much I have enjoyed this working this working relationship, how much I've learned from it, uh, and I think really for for patients and doctors and nurses to work together that's the only way. So I suppose again when you say what else would I say I think if something doesn't work people should speak up hundred percent and often speak up earlier. So if it's a little bit with something logistic which doesn't work because then it, it may be, we, we may just be blind to it. We may not be aware of it because we don't, obviously we, we sort of try to do all that from our side, but we may not see how it is received. So I think speak, again, communication, speak early. Uh, and I think the future of endocrinology, I think is bright. We have great clinic committee. We have a lot of really excellent juniors coming through, very, very good specialist nurses. And uh, through the pandemic, I think we have sharpened our focus on how we can improve things. We have more ways of working. Like we are now on a video call. Neither of us had to go on a tra- get on a train. Uh, so I, I think, uh, yes, and I, I mean, we should just, any input from you, any thoughts from your, from any patient support group will be always be most welcome to, to join in because that's, I think that's the only way for us. Excellent. Well, thank you. And if you're listening, please do feed in to us or, you know, to your endocrinologist that we're always keeping that communication flowing Um, which is so important and the pandemic has brought many silver linings of which questioning things and throwing things up in the air is one Um, and not having to get on so many trains is definitely another (laughs) but Stephanie thank you so much it's been really so enjoyable speaking to you um, today and being part of our awareness month program Um, there are other sessions that are available which will all be on youtube or on our website Um, if it's october 2022 as you're watching this please do check out and see if you'd like to come to any of our live events otherwise do visit our resources at pituitary.org.uk we are really proud to have brought a whole range of talks um, and workshops for free 10 to 785 that's 70085 to donate 10 pounds text cost 10 pounds plus one standard rate message or you can visit our website and see lots of other ways to donate but thank you for your time and thank you again stephanie and we look forward to seeing you soon thank you for having me ren take care bye bye